you have your Bibles with you, you can open your Bibles to the book of Ephesians. If you're using a pew Bible, I believe it's on page 1220, 1227. This is um, Paul's letter to the church in Ephesus. It was written about 60 A.D., about 30 years after the Lord was raised from the dead. And it was probably written by Paul while he was in a Roman prison to the Christians in the city of Ephesus. We're in chapter 5, and let me begin with verse 8 of chapter 5, page 1227. For you were once in darkness, but now you are light in the world, light in the Lord. Live as children of light, for the fruit of the light consists of all goodness, righteousness, and truth. And find out what pleases the Lord. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. For it is shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible, for it is light that makes everything visible. That is why it is said, wake up, O sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Let's pray. Father God, we give you thanks that you have revealed yourself to us, and as we come to your word, Lord, we pray that you would you would give us understanding. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. This past week, I had the opportunity to go shopping with Julia. Julia and I went to the local shop and save. And if you're from Asia, um, people in Asia particularly don't eat things that are cold, particularly things like we would take for granted, like ice water or cold milk on your cereal. So Julia and I went to buy some hot oatmeal. And so I walked out of the store, maybe spent $5 on some oatmeal and two pounds of raw sugar. I have to have sugar with my oatmeal. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, this morning, I had some oatmeal. And, you know, as I'm eating my oatmeal, I'm thinking, you know, eating my oatmeal is an act that I do all by myself. It affects nobody. And then I began to think, well, maybe that's not true. Because somewhere, somebody harvested the sugar cane. And, and part of what I spent on that oatmeal and sugar went to pay the workers that harvested the sugar cane, whether it be in Cuba or Costa Rica. And part of what I paid for that oatmeal went to pay the farmer who grew the oats and paid those who harvested the oats. And then I began to think more, well, there's a factory or there's a, a warehouse where the sugar cane was shipped to and there was a forklift driver who had to move the pallets within the, within the shipping place onto the cargo ships to, to get it here. And so part of what I spent on the oatmeal and sugar on the sugar went to pay the forklift operator. And then I thought, but the forklift operator probably needs to use the restroom periodically, and sometimes the restroom is broken, and so it has to hire a plumber, and therefore part of what I paid for the oatmeal paid for the plumber who came to fix the restroom so the forklift driver could move the sugar. And then I thought, but the forklift driver, he had to stop, I mean, the, the, the plumber had to stop and get gas before he could get to the factory to replace the toilet to, so, you, you know the story. And so then I'm thinking, you know, my little act, which I think I do in isolation, sitting in my kitchen, eating a, quiet, eating a bowl of oatmeal before anybody's up, has no effect. But in reality, it does. The year was 1970. It was the end of a wild period within American history. Most of us live through the 60s and the 70s. Dr. Jones, the famous missionary and author and evangelist, was asked what he thought the number one problem of the church, of the Christian community here in America, 
at that time was? And he replied quickly that the number one problem was irrelevance. He went on to say that 34, three-fourths of the people who thought the church was irrelevant, their attitude stemmed from the fact that they were disappointed in the Christian community. They were disappointed in Christians because we as Christians, as we read the gospel and live our lives, we are to make the world different. But he said the promise during that generation went largely unfulfilled. Forty-four years have passed, and what Dr. Jones spoke of is still true today. A recent Gallup poll reports that 77% of those who took the poll agreed that religion is losing its influence in America, that Christianity is no longer having an impact on the culture that it once did. George Bernard, who put together the polls, said this. He said, after four decades of studying churches in America, I'm convinced that the typical church as we know it today has a rapidly expiring shelf life. End of quote. In 1998, he predicted that within a few years, America would either experience a massive spiritual revival or, or moral anarchy. 16 years later, since when he first said that in 1998, the massive revival seems nowhere in sight here in America. But we see moral anarchy at every turning of a page. How did it happen? The church in America has lost its influence. There are many reasons why this is so, but one reason stands out above all the rest. The church, the body of believers, Christians have lost their influence because Christians have neglected to be and taken their responsibility to be the light in the world. As we've neglected to be what God has called us to be, the world has decided to simply ignore us because we are irrelevant. We have nothing to offer. If you know your American history, you know that that was not always the way it was. The first hundred universities founded in America were founded as Christian universities by Christians. The Puritans who landed in Connecticut in the 1650s, Reverend Danforth wanted to create a theocracy, a community that believed that they ought to influence every area of life. They wanted to erect a government that that had justice in it, that were practicing biblical norms of justice. But they also wanted to create an educational institution that would educate men and women so that they could leave godly lives, both, both within the church and within the civic community. Hagen and I probably a year, maybe almost two years ago, had a chance to visit that institution that the Puritans founded in 1701. We today know it as Yale University. Do you know why it was formed? Let me read to you. Let me read to you their statement of purpose. Quote, wherein youth may be instructed in the arts and sciences through the blessing of Almighty God and for his service, that they may be fitted for public service, both in the church, in the training as missionaries and clergy, and in carrying out their duties in the civil state. That was the purpose of Yale University, 1701. It was to train up men and women to live godly lives. Interestingly, they were accepting students into Yale University from China in 1780. There were 20, about 20 students from China in 1780 that 
attended Yale University. Some of those Chinese students went on to found Tsinghua University in Beijing, which today is probably the most famous university in China. So what has happened? When Paul wrote to the young church in Ephesus, he knew they were an island. They were a city. They were believers in a city that was filled with darkness. How could the tiny band of believers make a difference in this cosmopolitan metropolis? It was the, it was the home of the world-famous temple to Artemis. And so in Ephesians 5, Paul gives the answer. He says to them, here... You're living in Ephesus, you're living in darkness, you're living in a city that is filled with, with sin and with evil, but here's how you're to live. You are, Paul says in this, these verses, you are the light of God. Live like it. Let your light shine. It will dispel the darkness. Some people won't like it. Shine your light anyway. Others will join you in the light. What worked in the first century still works today. In our passage, we see three remarkable results when the light of God enters the dark world. And that's what we're going to be talking about this morning. The three <coughs> remarkable results when the light of God enters a dark world. First, light transforms. Verse 8. And, and please remember, when Jesus was teaching... He said, I am the light of the world. That Jesus identifies himself as being that light. So verse 8 reads, For you were once in darkness, but now you are the light in the Lord. Live as children of light. Here we have a beautiful picture of what it means to come to know God. Coming to know God is like walking from the darkness of a room into a room that has blazing light. Once you come out of the darkness, you see things that you never saw before. When you lived in darkness, you did whatever you wanted to do. But now in the light, you put off the things that you did in darkness, and you begin to practice a lifestyle that is fitting those who belong to the light. And verse 9 spells this out for us. For the fruit of the light consists of goodness, righteousness, and truth. Goodness touches on how we treat other people with kindness and mercy and with gentleness and with patience. Righteousness involves a new commitment that we live based on God's standards, not our own. Truth demands a deep commitment to live with integrity and honesty and justice. And what's our goal? Verse 10 gives it to us. Find out what pleases the Lord. As children of the light, our mantra is, we will do whatever pleases the Lord. No longer can we say, as our culture says, if it feels good, do it. We no longer can say that. We no longer can say, oh, but everybody else is doing that. We no longer can say, I don't care what other people think. We are no longer free agents. We no longer have the ability to make our own moral choices. Christians believe something stupendous has happened in this world. Christians believe, Christians believe that in time and in history, God created the world. But this God was not an unknown God, that this God, because he is a God of love, was benevolent and loving, and he made himself known to us. God did not hide himself from us, but he made himself known to us, and he made himself known to us in the written word, as he spoke to men and women of old, and in the person of Jesus. So that when we come to the Christian faith, we believe in a God who has made himself known. And as he's made himself known, he has given us certain moral laws to follow. 
which includes who we sleep with and who we don't sleep with, how we conduct our business affairs, what is just, what is unjust, how we spend our money, and other choices that we make in life so that our Christian life affects every area of our lives. Our morals affect how we work with others, how we conduct business, how we create laws, how we practice justice. Now, the world thinks this is pretty strange. And in fact, the world calls, calls us intolerant because we believe what God says in the Bible. When it comes to things like who we sleep with, we believe that God has spoken clearly that sex before marriage is wrong. And that once you're married, sex with somebody else, adultery, is wrong. That homosexual behavior is wrong. We believe there is a God in heaven who has spoken and said, this is how I want you to live life. This is how you bring honor and glory to me. It's one of the reasons why we don't support gay marriage. The government can pass all the laws that it wants, but no parliament, no act of Congress, no edict from the Supreme Court can overturn what God has said. Now, I mention sexual sins such as homosexuality because it's in the news constantly. But Paul's focus in these verses goes well beyond sex. It includes every area of life. To be a child of life means that you pray every day, Lord, show, show me how I can please you. Last two weeks, Vicki has been home, and, and Vicki ha, has been uh, helping me a great deal in, in China during the summer with our, our school in Suzhou. Um, and with a translation project that she's doing with a Christian publisher for us. And as, as she's getting to know us in, in the company, I showed her our mission statement. And she read our mission statement as a company, and she was sort of taken back. Our mission statement reads, to support international students and their families who want to study abroad in ways that bring glory and honor to God. And she said, Dad, is this a religious organization? I said, well, in a sense it is. Because my faith touches area, every area of life. As Christians, we don't live in a dichotomy. That I practice my religious life over here, and then I go into my business world, and I can do whatever I want to do. And I think part of the reason that universities like Yale and Harvard and MIT have moved away from their original position is because of this divide between nature and grace. That we think that there is a dichotomy. That people ought to keep their religious life private. And then go over here and practice whatever they want to practice in their business life or their social life or their educational life or in their, the life of law and justice. As Christians, we need to remind ourselves we don't live life perfectly. Even though we believe that our religious life and our life in the world is melded into one and that all that we do ought to bring glory and honor to God, we fall short many times. And so even though I am talking about the ideal, I stand before you and say, I fall. I don't always get it right. But with God's help, if our desire is to please Him, then God moves along, alongside of us and helps us to please him. But the question is, is our de desire to please the Lord? Do we pray, Lord, show me how I may please you? Secondly, light exposes. Look at verse 11 and 12. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. It's shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret. No doubt Paul had in mind the various acts that were committed within the temple of Artemis. The temple of Artemis was one of the seven wonders of the world, 
and it attracted people from distant lands who came to see the temple of Artemis. But the temple of Artemis combined idolatry as well as every perverted sense of sexual excess. And so Paul says, these things that are done in secret, he goes, they go way beyond ordinary acts of rebellion. They're gross, they're perverted. He says, don't even speak of them lest they give people excuse to practice them. But the light of the gospel, he says, exposes what is evil. Now the word expose here, some of your translations use the word rebuke. The word expose here does not mean finger pointing. It doesn't mean Christians go into the culture and start pointing the finger, oh, you're bad, oh, that's bad, or you're not doing what you ought to be doing. The word expose means that by your lifestyle, you live such a different lifestyle that the light of your lifestyle, the light of Jesus through you, exposes the darkness. How often have you heard of people who work in, in factories or um, uh, business offices where their life is so distinctive that without saying a word, everybody around them is using foul language, but they rise above all that. They practice godliness. And the people in the office notice. People know that you're different by the way that you live. And so what Paul is saying here is we expose the darkness. We expose that which is evil by the way that we live. And so when the gospel, when the light of the gospel enters a family, when a person within a family becomes a Christian, the light of that ought to expose what's happening to the family so that the family begins to see their own sinfulness and their need for Jesus. But the light shines not only in families, but it shines in communities and businesses. Verse 13 describes the result of this ministry of reproof. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible, and everything that is illumined becomes light. One of the uh, paraphrase version says, light exposes the true character of everything. And that applies not only to the culture, it applies to us. So the light of the gospel, as I read the word, it exposes within my life my own hypocrisy, my own sins, my own pride, my own sinful ambitions our love of money, our need for power, our lust for approval, and all the other hidden idols of our heart. And the last phrase of verse 13 suggests that the light actually has transforming power. Verse 13 reads this way, It is even possible, after all it happened to you, for light to turn the thing it shines upon the light also. Light penetrates, it scatters the darkness. Light penetrates, scatters the darkness, but it also exposes that which is evil, and then light begins to change the very thing it shines upon. Darkness only produces more darkness, but light can turn darkness into light. Light can turn darkness into light. Think about your own life. Think about your own life. I was in college when I became a Christian, and it was the lifestyle of a guy named John Grope who was my roommate, whose life was so distinctive that he's lived out his life before me in a very giving and a sacrificial way, impacted my life. I said, I want what he has. What do you have? How come you live your life with hope and meaning and purpose? How come you live your life in a way that loves other people even when they hate you? What is it about your life that's different? One of the familiar gospel songs that Hank Williams wrote many, many years ago says, I wandered so aimlessly, life filled with sin, I wouldn't let my dear Savior in. Then Jesus came like a stranger in the night. Praise the Lord, I saw the light. I saw the light, no more darkness, no more night. Now I'm happy, no sorrow in sight. Praise the Lord, I saw the light. Number three, light awakens. Verse 14. This is why it said, wake up, sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Now, 
these particular, verse 14, there, there is some um, discussion as to where these verses came from because it's a quote. It doesn't come directly out of the Old Testament. Some believe that Paul is using a very early hymn. And the very early hymn, perhaps, was a baptismal hymn. And so he's taking these words from the baptismal hymn to make his point. In his ministry in the First Baptist Church in Dallas, um, W.A. Criswell preached on this verse many times, and he talked about this verse sort of being the Bible in miniature. And he compared it to Ephesians 5.14 um, uh, to John 3.16, saying that both verses contain that which is essential to understanding salvation. He was fond of saying that this verse calls for something that's impossible. This verse calls, rise from the dead. Now, when we've studied Ephesians 2 before, we know that Paul had taught that we're dead in our sins and trespasses. And dead people don't rise from the dead on their own. If you go into a mortuary, if Morris takes you into a mortuary, and you start talking to dead people and telling them to rise, people will thought you're a little loony. They might take you away. A man who is dead cannot raise himself. He must be quickened. And when we say he must be quickened, the light of the gospel comes into your life. You hear the word, either from a friend or when you're in worship. You hear the word, maybe through the own reading of the Bible on your own. And it awakens you spiritually. It draws you to Jesus. We sometimes call it the regeneration of your heart and your mind. We sometimes call it quickening. We sometimes call it having new birth, new life. Listen to these verses that come from a selection of verses. This is from John 1, 12 and 13. But to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God who were born not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. They were born, they were quickened, they were made alive, not by the will of man, not by the flesh, but by God. Or Titus, chapter 3, verse 5. He saved us not because of deeds done by us and righteous, but in virtue of his own ministry, by the washing of regeneration and the renewal of the Holy Spirit. Or Deuteronomy chapter 30. And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your offspring so that you will love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul that you may live. He will circumcise your heart. He will cause you to have a new heart. Listen to the words of Ezekiel. A new heart I will give you and a new spirit I will put within you and I will take out of your flesh the heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And as you read through the scriptures, you learn, even though Hank Williams wrote that song, I saw the light, I saw the light, theologically, that's incorrect. You didn't see the light. (laughs) You were in darkness. You were dead. God, by his grace and his mercy, as you read his word, as you listened to his word being taught, his word, the power of the Holy Spirit, enlightened you, caused your heart and your mind to be alive. It transformed you. It's the life-transforming power of the gospel. So in summary, these three things. First, the light shines on us, the gospel, Jesus, and transforms us out of darkness into light. Secondly, the light shining through us chases away the darkness and exposes evil. And thirdly, the light awakens those who are asleep and raises them from the dead. It quickens them. When Robert Louis Stevenson, the American author, who spent time in Portland, when Robert Louis Stevenson was a young child, he was sick much of the time. He couldn't go out and play like other children, so he spent a lot of time at his window. And one evening he sat and he watched a man come down the street lighting the gas lamps. Bob and Morris probably remember the gas lamps. 
But Robert Louis Stevenson, as a young boy, sat at his window and watched the man coming down and lighting the gas lamps in the midst of the darkness. His nurse came into him and said, what are you doing? Robert Louis Stevenson replied, I'm watching the man punching holes into the darkness. What a beautiful picture. We are called to punch holes in the darkness in the name of Jesus. I think in our culture we are facing a magnificent opportunity. Earlier I spoke of the moral decay going on all around us. But I'm not in despair because the darker it is, the brighter the light shines. It's precisely when the world is at its worst that the people of God can be at their best. We were made for times like this. God has placed us here in the beginning of the 21st century exactly for this purpose, that our light might shine in the midst of the darkness. Now, don't be deceived. It's not easy. The world doesn't want the light, but the world desperately needs the light. Don't get pompous. We're not called to save the world. Only God can do that. But we are called to make a difference. We can't do everything, but we can do something. We can do something. You can punch holes into the darkness. The question is, where in your life are you punching holes into the darkness? Where in your life? Is it in your family? Is it in the community? Is it in your school? Where are you punching holes into the darkness? You can do it as God gives you grace and power. And we ought to do it. The question for you this morning, and I want you to go home and ponder it, is you are called to be the light in the world. You all will tell me, oh, Jay, this world is filled with darkness. I agree with you. What's the big deal? You were called to punch holes into that darkness in the name of Jesus. Go out into the world this week and punch holes in the darkness. In the name of Jesus. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. <laughs> Father God, we give you thanks for your word. And we give you thanks, Father, because you give us hope. We live in a world filled with evil. We live in a world that is filled with despair. But we are a people of hope because you are our God. And you give us the task to live our lives worthily before you. And you fill us with your power, with your light, so that we in some small measure reflect the light of Jesus. Help us to be that people in the midst of darkness. Help us to punch holes in the darkness for Jesus' sake. In his name we pray. Amen.